The choice is about risk and benefit. And we need to understand both sides of that equation in order to make a good choice. And what's been missing is a good proper understanding of risk. That's a lot of what we've talked about today. But the other thing that's been missing is you asking the right questions of your provider so that you can understand the benefit. What is the benefit of taking these antibiotics? Why do I need them? And if we can cut down on the unnecessary antibiotic use, that is the most powerful way for us to protect ourselves. It is clear the gut does eventually recover. We do get the species back. How long does that take usually? This is the million dollar question. Today's episode is with Dr. Will Bolsowitz. Dr. B is a gastroenterologist and two-time New York Times bestselling author. In this conversation, we focus on how antibiotics affect the microbiome and what we can do should we need to take antibiotics to help our microbiome recover. Before we get into this episode, a quick reminder to please subscribe on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or whatever platform you're tuning in from. Your support is greatly appreciated and enormously important to this show finding its way into the ears of more people. And now, my conversation with Dr. Will Bolsowitz. The number of direct messages I've got over the years from people saying, Simon, what's the deal with antibiotics? How are they working? How are they affecting my gut? What should I be doing during a course of antibiotics and post-antibiotics to help my microbiome recover? And of course, to help us explore that and answer all of these questions, we bring back our resident gastroenterologist, the man, Dr. B. Welcome back. Back in the house, the proof, here we go. It's Bolsowitz, right? Well. Is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that how we're pronouncing it? You know, we... Uh, you're calling me out a bit here. We have Americanized the, our, our last name. So it's a Polish last name. Um, and if you go to Poland, I think it actually kind of rolls off the tongue in a very effortless way. So they say Bolshevitz. But when you come to the United States, people start reading it like it's an English oh. word. It's not an English word. It's Bols a Polish name. Bolshevitz. Bolshevitz. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that it's not just me that wanted to to know if we were pronouncing it right. Have, I should have worn my, for, my full Polish regalia to the... <laughs> next time yeah <laughs> yeah all right well i think our listeners will be really interested in exploring antibiotics and what antibiotics are how they how they work how they interact with the microbiome and and should we have to take a course of antibiotics what can we do to kind of restore the microbiome and and help it recover so perhaps we we start super high level with this with what are antibiotics? Sure. Um, well, this is an important topic that we're going to discuss today because I get messages all the time through direct messages, emails, um, people who are wondering, you know, should I take this antibiotic? Should I not take the antibiotic? Um, and what do I do to recover my gut? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And, um, you know, the question is, what, what are antibiotics? And it's interesting because the, you know, if we were to sort of say in a modern context, what are antibiotics? They are any sort of chemical compound that has the ability to cause injury to microbes. Microbes, not just bacteria, but also fungi could be a way that we would describe this. Um, so you sort of break down the word antibiota, but the origin of this word, actually, this word was used even before penicillin was invented and commercially available. And the way that they intended the word in its original form was the compounds produced by microbes to kill other microbes. So when we take antibiotics, how do they actually work? Um, well, they are destroying microbes. Uh, that's the simple answer. And, um, and is that you know, indiscriminatory? Are they, they're destroying the pathogenic bacteria that we're trying to get rid of. And at the same time, they're destroying good bacteria. Unfortunately, they are, uh, they do not discriminate. And as we're going to learn, as we dive deeper into this episode, um, they have a profound effect on your 
uh, microbiome and the community. There's a number of different ways the antibiotics do have an effect. But if we if we start first start by looking at this in terms of you have an infection, right? And it could be one of any different types of infections. It could be a sinus infection, it could be a lung infection like a pneumonia, it could be a urinary tract infection. Um, you know, what is going on? Well, right now, prior to taking the antibiotics, you already have dysbiosis. You already have a disturbed microbiome. And the reason why we know that is because domination is taking place by pathogenic microbes. Pathogenic refer to the ones that cause disease. They are dominating in this context. And so what we need to restore order is to knock down those pathogenic microbes. And in a perfect world, we would love to simultaneously elevate the good guys. But the problem is that's not what an antibiotic does. An antibiotic does not select for the good guys and make them more prominent. An antibiotic just simply destroys. And in the process of doing this, the, um, this community of microorganisms, you know, we think about the microbiome. So we've talked about the microbiome. We, we talked about it all the way back in 2018 in episode 17, which is uh, the origin story for our relationship. Um, and we've had a number of episodes since where we've talked about the microbiome. But, you know, in short, the microbiome is a community of microorganisms that inhabit and cover all external facing parts of our body, our, our skin, our nose, our mouth. Believe it or not, your eyeball has a microbiome. You're looking at microbes right now. You just don't realize it because um, they're so small. We don't see them. And the inside of our intestines in a quite bizarre and fascinating thing the inside of our intestines are actually outside of our body. So when we unpack that, it's a tube. It's a tube that starts at your mouth. It's continuous. It's never broken. That tube is never broken. And it ends at your bottom. And so because your mouth is actually connecting to external to your body, and so is your bottom, and everything in between is part of this tube, then whatever is inside of that tube is technically outside of your body. So within this tube, your intestines, we have 38 trillion microbes. This is the principal uh, focus when we talk about our microbiome, but of course we could be talking about skin or mouth or nose or eyeball, other, you know, in, in a different context, there's, there's eyeball antibiotics. Um, but uh, typically we're talking about the gut microbiome. And um, when um, we take an antibiotic, every single one of these microbes, these 38 trillion, there's going to be the possibility of susceptibility to this antibiotic. Because again, these antibiotics are designed to destroy microbes. Any microbe that is susceptible to this antibiotic potentially is going to be killed. You're wiping out the bad guys. At the same time, there's a little bit of collateral damage that's taking place. I would argue beyond a little bit of collateral damage because you know this microbiome, it's diverse. And yes, there is this dominant negative bad guy that's taking over, causing an infection. Um, but there's all these other good ones, all these other species, and we're going to be unfortunately smashing them in the process. So antibiotics, I guess, are, are commonly cast in a very negative light with regards to how they affect the gut. But maybe it's important for us to just hit on what, what have antibiotics allowed us to treat and what have they done to human health span and lifespan? It's such a nuanced conversation because when, if we if we go too hard in one direction, we're not being honest with this topic. You know, if you just say antibiotics are bad, that's ridiculous. That is completely insane. Antibiotics are like literally, I would argue, the greatest achievement of modern medicine. In all sincerity, um, I think they've added more life years for each of us than any other thing that has taken place in the last 100 years. But I think if we sort of go back in time and we look at roughly the year 1900, like the turn of the 20th century, the top three causes of death were infections, pneumonia, gastrointestinal infections, tuberculosis. The reason why these were the top causes of death is like we didn't have a great way to treat them. So if you if you ended up with one of these issues, you were in big trouble. And how effective are antibiotics at treating those conditions? Intensely effective. Incredibly effective. Um, life saving. So they have their place. 
Well, and let's not just leave it at this though, to be honest with you, Simon. Um, that's the direct effect of antibiotics. Yes, we can treat infections with antibiotics. But now here are our new top causes of death. Number one, heart disease. Number two, cancer. Okay. Um, if you have heart disease uh, and you have a heart attack, you need an invasive intervention, right? You need someone to actually go up into your blood vessels and open up the blockage. They could do that with a bypass uh, surgery, coronary artery bypass graft, cabbage, um, or they could do this with a stent. But either way, that was facilitated by antibiotics. You can't open up a person and do surgery, open surgery, like open chest, open heart surgery without antibiotics. You can't do a cath without antibiotics. A risk that they'll get an infection. They'll get an infection. Hmm. And the same is true with, with cancer. You know, the person has colon cancer. What do we need to do? Well, step one is we call the surgeon. Right. And we need to remove it. And antibiotics have facilitated our ability to actually perform that surgery and remove the cancer. And we would have a lot more people dying from number one and number two, uh, heart disease and cancer, if it were not for antibiotics. So we we're talking about something that has dramatically transformed modern medicine in a good way. How commonly are they prescribed? <laughs> Too commonly. This is part of the issue. This is part of the issue. Um, if we look in the United States, first of all, the number of prescriptions that are happening in the United States. Um, uh, last time that we have data, 2021, there were 211 million prescriptions for antibiotics in that year in the United States. So, and if we look at that in terms of like the population of the United States, if we had um, 10 people in a room with us right now, I would be doling out six prescriptions to those 10 people for antibiotics. So these are commonly prescribed. Now, it's interesting. We've actually reduced antibiotic use in the United States in the last 10 years. It used to be worse. How so? How's that been achieved? Um, well, I think that there's been uh, messaging both within the medical community and also to the layperson to say that we need to be, we, you know, we call it antibiotic stewardship. So we need to be more cautious with the ways in which we use antibiotics. And I think that that, that sort of messaging, particularly in the face of um, antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is increasingly becoming a problem. So in the year 2019, uh, a million people worldwide died from antibiotic resistant bacteria, a million. So they get an infection, but the antibiotic is not, not effective. Is not effective. And this is not this like bizarre rare thing that no, no one sees. Um, this is something that every single doctor has had to deal with. And these antibiotic resistance, um, scenarios that we face, they are the result of antibiotics one way or another. Right. So if we're using a lot of antibiotics, the bacteria are kind of evolving in a way so that they can escape from, from, from the antibiotic being effective. Well, you know, part of their defense, part of the way in which bacteria exist and thrive and continue, like they, you know, um, have been around far longer than us simple humans. And I am highly convinced that no matter what happens, whether it be with AI or whatever, um, when humans are gone, these microbes will still be around. And the reason why Simon is because they are constantly evolving very, very, very quickly. And part of how they are able to accomplish this is, um, the numbers that they have, like think about 38 trillion microbes, right? So out of those 38 trillion, there are going to be some that are sensitive to antibiotics, but then there's going to be some that just so happen to have a mutation that allows them to survive in the face of antibiotics. And they may be a profound minority right now. Like they may be literally one in a million. But the problem is when you're talking about one in a million within the context of 38 trillion, well, gosh, there's quite a few of those one in a millions in there. And we treat with antibiotics those guys are fine. Everyone else is getting smashed. And so those guys now start to multiply because they're resistant. And so they start to become more dominant within your gut. And this is how we ultimately breed antibiotic resistance.
This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. Do we have a sense for how much damage one course of antibiotics can do and, and whether that damage is perhaps different for a younger person in the first few years of life versus an, an adult? I don't know how far you want me to go into this right now because I feel like this is something that we may be building towards is like getting into the details of what the research says of what happens when you take antibiotics and, and also how to deal with it after the fact. Um, but what I will say is that it appears very clearly that when we take antibiotics, there is a change that takes place within the microbiome that we call it an antibiotic scar. The antibiotic scar is here to stay. And it will be there and you, you um, will recover your gut. And it depends, like there are factors that affect that recovery. But even after you recover, there still is this antibiotic scar. And part of that antibiotic scar is the presence, increased presence of these antibiotic resistant bacteria, which by the way, we're already there. It's just that now they're, they've been selected. Perhaps you can remind us what a healthy microbiome is characterized by what does that mean when we say healthy microbiome well there's debate there's debate within the scientific community of how do you define a healthy gut microbiome there's but you know what i'm going to describe right now is the, the concepts the concepts that like all scientists agree on these concepts it's just like do we have a measure that we can apply you know whether it be in a study or clinically to um to actually say like this is healthy right but what does a healthy microbiome look like well um, first of all, there's a wide uh, range, a, a broad diversity of different species of microbes. And that's because the gut is an ecosystem. So just like any other ecosystem on the planet, whether it be your gut and its microbes, or it's the Great Barrier Reef and the fish that live there, or it's the Amazon rainforest and the animals and bugs and whatnot, in all ecosystems, diversity is a measure of resistance, of strength within that community because they actually lean on one another. So that if something were to happen, because you have that diversity, it's able to pull through and emerge on the other side. So diversity is one factor that we see in a healthy gut microbiome. Typically higher diversity tends to be better. A second factor is what is the constitution or makeup of the individual species within this community? And what is the balance between these different species that exist? So when you have certain microbes that are anti-inflammatory, beneficial to human health, trying to support us humans, we want as many of those as possible. And in a healthy gut, that's what you're gonna see. Examples of these are Lactobacillus, Bifidobacterium, Fecalbacterium prosnitzii, Acromantia. These are just a couple of the buzz terms that people hear. How many species would the typical person have in their gut? Um, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a tricky question to answer, to be honest with you, because Sometimes you'll see studies where they're like, oh, there's 50 species here. And it really depends on the technique that they're using to measure the different species. But most scientists would agree that there's somewhere in the range of 300 to 1,000 unique species that exist within the gut. And how much does that, do you know, differ between people? Substantially. If you take two identical twins, same genetic code, literally the exact same genetic code, same parents in the vast majority of cases growing up in the exact same household, despite all of those things that are the same, they will only share somewhere in the range of about 25% of the same microbes. That's incredible. And that's, and that's like, you know, a best case scenario. Whereas the rest of us, you know, my siblings, for example, I probably share five to 10% of the same microbes with my siblings, even though we come from the same family and whatnot. Mm. So anyway, getting back to this sort of like, what is a healthy gut? Well, we want the good guys to outnumber the bad guys. There are these inflammatory microbes, E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella. They're there. We all have them. We just, but... If they're not, if they're not playing a dominant role in your gut, if the good guys are there more per pervasively, then they can suppress these bad guys and the bad guys can't really do anything. So, and because you have this balance, more good guys than bad guys, diversity, it builds strength. And that strength leads to, in its own way, um, a strong gut barrier where the epithelial layer that lines the intestines 
remains intact. And when the gut starts to break down, one of the consequences of gut breakdown is the disruption of the gut barrier, which some people refer to as leaky gut. Right. So that's those epithelial cells are what separate, you mentioned before, the tube, the outside world to our body. This is the this is the principal layer that is creating the separation between the outside world and our body. And it is a single layer of cells, incredibly thin. Um, you couldn't see it with the naked eye. It's like taking a piece of your, uh, plucking one of your hairs and then shaving it uh, probably a couple times. And so, but then this single layer of cells, the cells are fused together by these proteins. Um, the main one that we often talk about are called tight junctions. And these tight junctions will hold these cells together so that this becomes a wall. And that wall is a barrier that prevents things from accessing our bloodstream or getting access to our immune system. Our immune system is right on the other side of this wall. So, but if you break down those tight junctions, then you pop open these spaces between these cells. And by popping open these spaces, this is how you create increased intestinal permeability, which people often refer to as leaky gut. Right. Which can trigger things like inflammation. Uh, they contribute to things like inflammation. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah. And like, this is a, these are hallmark signs of what we describe as dysbiosis. So what I was describing previously, you asked me what is a healthy gut. The, the technical term that we would use there is eubiosis, E-U. Um, this is dys dysbiosis, D-Y-S. And um, what we're seeing is like the counterpoint to eubiosis, where you have a loss of diversity, lower diversity. There's less good guys. Because there's less good guys, they can't suppress the bad guys. So now the, the bad guys are rising up. They're becoming more dominant. And um, within uh, this context, the disruption that this has... Um, had on actually like the physical barrier, it ends up breaking up these tight junctions and you get this increased intestinal permeability. So this is sort of, we're drawing this picture of dysbiosis, which involves gut diversity, loss of balance and disruption of the gut barrier. So maybe take us inside the gut. Let's create a scenario here where we're, we're talking about a health, a person with a healthy microbiome, right? And they have great diversity, but they develop an infection. And I think before you said that when you develop the infection, you'll be in a state of dysbiosis. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. They take their course of antibiotics. What's happening to that person's microbiome during that, that phase? Well, there are uh, three main things that happen within the microbiome when you take antibiotics. One, a loss of diversity. Two, um, you are causing widespread damage to the species. And three, you are choosing or selecting the uh, resistant microbes. And so effectively, if you think about, we were just talking about dysbiosis a moment ago, and then you, the next question was, what happens when you take antibiotics? And after describing them, basically what I've just described is you are medically inducing dysbiosis. And um, with the exception of adding the antibiotic resistance element. Are the antibiotics, are they eradicating species? Like are, are we actually losing, I think you said so, some studies show you may only have 50 species, but then there's you know other uh, reviews and whatnot that'll say 300 to 1,000. So the jury's a little bit out there. But when we take whatever the number is that we have, we take antibiotics are we losing species or are we kind of just like dimming the light and losing the total number of the good guys that exist in the gut, but we still have the species that we had before we were taking the antibiotics? Well, the, 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 um, the term that we use for species when we're looking at these things is, is richness. Richness is the term for a number of different species, which is a little bit different than diversity, by the way. Diversity also takes into account the presence of different species. So like, for example, you know, um, we wouldn't call it um, diverse if we had 300 of one species and, you know, one of like five other species, right? Like that's just, but uh, anyway, so with, with this, when we look at richness, which is the number of different species, we see that when you take antibiotics, you are re definitely reducing the richness. Now the question is, will they come back? Because I do, because if they do come back, then it's more akin to what you're describing of dimming the lights. Um, and if you look at the research 
it is clear the gut does eventually recover. We do get the species back. How long does that take usually? This is the million dollar question. And that brings me to, it feels like this is a good time for us to talk about a new study that came out uh, about a year ago in the journal Cell, which um, we've talked about on this show before. Cell is one of the most prestigious medical journals out there. And in this study, Simon, they took a group of 20 people. Now, let me say these people did not have infections. And the reason why they chose to study healthy people is because if you, as we were discussing a moment ago, if a person has an infection, like their microbiome is already disrupted. So let's start with a healthy microbiome that has not been disrupted and see what the effect of these antibiotics are. And so they gave four different types of antibiotics to these people and they watched to see what happens. Now, our response to these antibiotics is very individualized. So you can't say that because you took this antibiotic, this is exactly how long your microbiome is going to be knocked down, and this is when you will recover. For the majority of the people in this study, and by the way, it was only five days of antibiotics, only five days, whereas like many antibiotics, people take for 10 or 14 days, and in some cases, people are taking for even more than 14 days. In this study, the vast majority of people recovered their microbiome by two months. Okay. And were they, were they adopting any specific protocols? I know we're going to talk For about recovery, that. no, they did not. But right. there were people that were in this study that wished that they had specific protocols because there were some bad things that took place. So there was, a, again, these are healthy people. They showed up and they were, and participated in a study and were grateful that they did this. Do you know what kind of antibiotics they were taking? Yeah, the, these were mostly antibiotics that were given for pneumonia. So there was basically like a series of four different antibiotics that were like typical sort of pneumonia style uh, antibiotics. So like an example would be levofloxacin. Levofloxacin is one of the examples. So we call that levoquin in the United States. So um, anyway, there were three people that had a completely different response to the antibiotics. And it's actually quite disturbing what happened to these three people. They lost diversity, they continued to lose diversity, and they did not recover their microbiome for six months. And in that process, um, their microbiome, and the authors, by the way, literally say what I'm about to say. This is not me just being hyperbolic. This is like the exact language they used in the paper. Their microbiome resembled what you would find in a person who is sick, like extremely sick, critically ill in the intensive care unit. So um, we don't know exactly why that happened to those particular people. Did they look at, at what these people were eating? Uh, they did not look at what these people were eating but they did look at their diversity. And again, this is a very small study. Um, one of the uh, challenges that we have when we get into this space of discussing antibiotics and what happens after antibiotics is that we need more data. Yeah, I was just thinking then, like, are we, are we assuming that antibiotics across the board all have the same effect? Because no, they there don't. are so many, right? No, they don't. They have different effects. Well, but I think what they're showing in this study, though, is that like here are these different antibiotics that you could use to treat pneumonia. Again, pneumonia, if you don't take an antibiotic, can be a life-threatening condition. So we, you need the antibiotics. And with these, uh, with these, in this case, here are these three people who have a very, very different response that appears to be like kind of disturbing in terms of how this all played out. And what they found for these three people is if you look at the starting diversity within their microbiome, again, this is a small number. Um, we need more data. But if you look at their starting diversity, their starting diversity was significantly less than the other people. That's interesting. That reminds me of the people in the Sonnenberg's fiber fermented food study with the, the folks who didn't do so well on the fiber diet. Yeah, they had low diversity because Same. they because with the low diversity, they were struggling to ramp up their fiber. We could talk about that's a whole right. other study. But that, that makes me, me think about this whole discussion of how do antibiotics affect the microbiome. It seems like your starting point is really important. So if, if you're someone who is healthy and has a rich microbiome, it may be that the effect of that antibiotic is different to say someone with IBS or a condition like SIBO who already has some disruption to the microbiome. I think that there's points of vulnerability that exist with specific people. And you know, one of the ways that we know this, Simon, is that there is a, there's a common infection called Clostridioides difficile. It's extremely dangerous. Unchecked untreated, this infection can clearly be life-threatening. And I've had patients 
granted years ago, but I've had patients who had to have their colon removed because this infection was so out of control. So when you say unchecked, untreated, someone could have that and not have any symptoms? Uh, no, they would typically have diarrhea, but um, some people, what they'll do when they have diarrhea is like, for example, they think that it's just a bug, a tummy bug, like a virus, and they'll take Imodium. And it, so Imodium is loperamide, which is taken to like basically slow down diarrhea, slow down bowel motility. And in the process of doing this, their intentions are good, but unfortunately it's, it's not a good choice because what ends up happening is your body is actually trying to evacuate this, um, uh, toxin that comes from the bacteria and you are now trapping the toxin inside your colon, which leads to something called toxic megacolon. And that's how people end up either in a life threatening compromised position or potentially getting their colon removed as a result of this infection. So, but the but the point with the infection though is that this is one of the clear cut, undeniable. Every single doctor in the United States, if they if they're board, if they if they're like a decent doctor, is going to acknowledge that this is a very real risk with antibiotics. Is that you could develop this infection after antibiotics? And if you take a look and see who are the people that are most at risk. Who are the people who are most at risk from developing this infection? The people who are most at risk are the people who have inflammatory bowel disease. And these are the people that have the deepest dysbiosis at baseline. So there's a vulnerability there. So I think that there's a vulnerability there where if you already have a, a damaged dysbiotic gut, then there is a higher risk of having complications as a result of your antibiotics. Okay. Okay. So, so far we've, we've kind of described this dimming of the light this loss of diversity i think my question earlier was a bit convoluted but i was trying to decipher if it, if it was a dimming of the light or if we were knocking out species can i can i add something real quick since since you're bringing that up there was one study where they took people and they put them on a triple antibiotic so i mean this was like this was not the five days of pneumonia treatment this was like a triple hardcore iv antibiotic those people lost species and they never came back so it is possible. I don't want to say like it's all dimming the lights, but I think in the vast majority of antibiotic cases, it is dimming the lights. So how can people kind of navigate this to, to make sure that when they are taking antibiotics that it is actually essential to be doing so? Well, I think first of all, that is the uh, million dollar question is do you need antibiotics in the first place, right? Like what is the best treatment for this issue? The best treatment is to only take them if you actually need them. And um, I mentioned earlier 211 million prescriptions for antibiotics. They actually, the, the Center for Disease Control in the United States um, believes that at a minimum, about 30% of those prescriptions are completely unnecessary at a minimum. All right, so that right there is 70 million antibiotic prescriptions that could have been thrown in the trash. And they actually think that it's probably closer to 50%. That would be over 100 million antibiotic prescriptions that we would be reducing in the United States in, in one year, in one year. Okay, so um, what, what, what are the ways that we can make a determination about whether or not antibiotics are necessary? Well, the key here is this has to be communication between you and the person who's prescribing the antibiotic. It, it, ultimately, we can't make these decisions on our own. We have to rely on the advice of, of the professional. But we are allowed to ask questions that open up communication and allow us to get closer to understanding this. So questions that I would recommend that people ask include, why do I need this antibiotic? What happens if I don't take this antibiotic? Is there a less strong antibiotic that I could take that's just as effective? If my symptoms improve, how long do I need to keep taking the antibiotic? That was a question I had because I, I remember growing up, I was prescribed amoxicillin quite a lot for like tonsillitis, which I never get these days. For some reason as a kid, I would have it sort of once a season or every couple of years and every time without fail. Do you have a, a penicillin allergy? No. And then they just write up the script for amoxicillin. And I was always under the impression that you need to finish the course or there could be some negative consequences down in, in the future and perhaps that antibiotic won't be as effective for you if you were to get that infection again. 
but then I've, I've heard more recently that maybe that's not the case. So if you're taking a course of antibiotics, your symptoms disappear, is that the best protocol to, to sort of stop taking that course? It really depends on what we're, what specifically we're trying to treat and what the level of threat of that infection is. So if you're talking about a very threatening infection, then in many cases, if I were the doctor, I would say, look, because this is such a serious infection, for example, a person who's had a severe case of diverticulitis, to me, we have to continue this course of antibiotics because I need to know that we're completely wiping out this infection. But on the flip side, there are some um, less severe infections that if the symptoms were to completely go away, then you may be able to stop the antibiotics early. And I think that ultimately, like you can't, you can't give a broad sweeping answer to this question. You have to talk to your doctor about that. And of course, there's, to your point earlier, there's going to be some people that have had surgery and are told to take a course of antibiotics. They, they don't really have an acute symptom as such. So, you know, in that instance, it makes sense to finish that course as prescribed. Yeah. And I, I mean, I will say that, you know, many of the sort of periods of time that we recommend our antibiotics for, um, it can be kind of just like gut feeling. Oh, I think that's to seven days or 10 days or 14 days. I mean, there's standard periods of time that are typically used by doctors, but many times your doctor and their decision making is making uh, a judgment call based upon how serious they think this infection is. And like, if you had a 14 day course of antibiotics and after five days you were completely asymptomatic, the chances are you probably don't need to finish all 14 days. So what do you think some of the health consequences are or could be from taking antibiotics too frequently and perhaps not taking certain steps to help the microbiome restore? Well, there's the things that are very, very clear um, where they're completely indisputable and undeniable. An example of this would be the C. diff infection that's possible as a result of taking antibiotics. Another is diarrhea that, that happens as a result of taking antibiotics, which for someone who's frail, you know, uh, a child or an elderly, uh, adult, then those, that's, that's something that, um, you know, you wouldn't just diminish, like it could, it could be dangerous. Um, and then there is the stuff that, is, you know, you're sort of building a case through research, a combination of population-based research. Um, and in some cases, you know, trials that we have observed what happens. But um, if you, I think that like the most compelling and clear data is with children. Mm -hmm. And there is this period of time that you and I have discussed before on the podcast during the first three years of life where the microbiome is rapidly evolving and changing for a child and dynamically like approaching what will become their adult microbiome. And when it gets to that place, it kind of locks in. And not to say that it never changes, but it becomes the microbiome that for the most part, this is what they're going to carry forward into adulthood. And so this period of time, this is like a rather vulnerable period of time where if you disrupt that process, there's consequences potentially. And what we have seen is that children who are exposed to antibiotics um, during those first three years, there's an increased risk of several downstream things. They tend to be metabolic things or um, immune related. Like food intolerances or allergies. So that's right. And that includes that antibiotic use has been associated with increased risk of obesity in children, um, as well as uh, increased risk of asthma. And there are also some uh, autoimmune diseases that have been associated with antibiotic use. Do you think that, I mean, th those are the facts, but I think I can imagine as a parent hearing that might be a little bit anxiety provoking. Um, I remember my, my nephew when he was, I think he was six months old, had to take a course of antibiotics for something. And um, my brother and sister-in-law were quite worried about the effect that that could have on his health. You know, it comes back to talking to your pediatrician and asking them whether or not the antibiotics truly are necessary. What we're really trying to avoid here is the prescription of antibiotics for viruses because there's no, there's no role for antibiotics to treat viruses. They only are intended to treat, you know, typically bacteria. But if you look statistically in the United States right now, 
by the time a child is five years old, they've had 25 courses of antibiotics. That is the average. Um, so look, sometimes they're necessary. Um, my, my daughter who's one years old, she's had antibiotics twice. She had ear infections. She needed them. Um, so, and when they're necessary, you give them. And, um, and then we will talk about some of the things that, that can be done to try to help and restore, help restore and repair the microbiome. Yeah. Maybe we step into that. That's a nice segue. Okay. So if someone's taking a course of antibiotics, what are the things that they could or should be thinking about both during and, and after that course of antibiotics? So many of these things have not been studied within the specific context of taking antibiotics. Again, there's a lot that we want to learn and we need to study. So we're extrapolating from other places. But first, let's talk about the dietary strategies that can be used. Um, the first thing that I would say is you want to be on a high fiber diet. And we have actual animal model data. Again, it's not human data, but it's rather compelling and was published in a great journal um, where they uh, put um, these, I believe, mice on either a high fiber diet or a low fiber diet. And what they found was that when uh, the mice that were on the high fiber diet, they sustained less damage while they were actively on the antibiotic. And then when you withdrew the antibiotic, their recovery was far more brisk. So they bounced back very quickly. That's the you know opposite of what you saw with the low fiber diet where there was a deeper dysbiosis, a deeper damage to the microbiome, and then subsequently a more prolonged recovery. Now, this all makes sense based upon everything that we know about how the microbiome works. What I would add as a caveat to this is that we've talked before, you and I, about the importance of consuming a diversity of plants. What's interesting about that entire concept is that um, if you take one form of fiber, like if, if your goal is to lift up microbes within your gut, if you take one form of fiber and you just start pounding that one form of fiber more, 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 it does not necessarily result in more benefits within the microbiome. There's a certain threshold. Once you meet that threshold, you are going to get whatever you're going to get. And then it's time to move on someplace else. So when we eat a diversity of plants, we're hitting as many different thresholds as possible because we're getting multiple different forms of fiber from multiple different types of plants. Which are feeding different species of different, bacteria. Feeding different species. And this, this becomes, again, like I have not seen a study of the intervention being a diversity of plants after antibiotics, but based upon everything that we know and understand and recognizing that, you know, here's this study where a high fiber diet was um, protective, it just makes complete sense that this is the way to approach this issue is not only to consume fiber, but to also consume a variety of different types of fibers. Right. And you're talking about at the moment during a course of antibiotics but would i be correct in saying that it would also be advantageous to be adopting a high fiber diet with a lot of diversity of plants proactively in the event that you may need to take antibiotics 110 percent, i would say before during and after is the ideal place to be now if you're hearing this like you know there's going to be people who they just got prescribed antibiotics they download this episode, like don't stress, you can't change the past, right? But what you can do starting today is start to implement these ideas, which includes a wide variety of plants. Mm -hmm. You can turn dial that dimmer back the other way. What where do where do sprouts come into this? We we had dinner last night with with Doug Evans and uh, Mike Posner, who are two big sprout guys. You're a big fan of sprouts. Yeah. They beneficial for the microbiome? Oh, I think the sprouts are clearly beneficial for the microbiome. I mean, the advantages, if you think about what are the advantages of sprouts, um, you can take lentils. Lentils are incredibly healthy, high in fiber, resistant starches, polyphenols. Those are all prebiotic. And when you sprout the lentils, Simon, if you gave me a half of a cup of lentils and you give me three days, I will return to you 
eightfold your investment. You will go 8x in three days. All right, I can give you four cups of lentils in that period of time. And that's what happens. They grow like crazy. And in the process of growing like crazy, you're cranking up the fiber. You're cranking up um, actually the protein content, believe it or not. You're increasing the vitamins. In many cases, you're unlocking new nutritional benefits, not necessarily related to recovery from antibiotics. But like if you want sulforaphane, which is, I mean, an amazing anti-inflammatory molecule, the most densely packed place for sulforaphane are broccoli sprouts. Are they your favorite sprouts? Are they my favorite? Yeah. They're up there. I wrote about sprouts in both of my two books, but the other thing that I would toss into the mix are fermented foods. So I don't think the fermented foods should be overlooked. I think that they're a wonderful opportunity to, um, particularly when you're consuming the plant-based fermented foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, when you do things like this, you are getting your fiber, you're getting your polyphenols, and you're also getting these uh, a diverse mix of many different varieties of bugs. And what we do know from the um, evidence when it comes to fermented foods, so you know, earlier you asked me, what happens when a person takes antibiotics? Well, I said, you lose diversity. We have evidence that by adding fermented food to your diet, you can increase diversity within 10 weeks. Um, we have evidence from the American Gut Project, which was a different study where people who consume fermented foods, you find the, you find the bugs from fermentation in their microbiome. So kraut, kimchi, these types of foods, yogurt or plant-based yogurt with live cultures. Those are both options. I would say that they're both options, dairy and non-dairy options of kefir and yogurt. You want to make sure they have live active cultures. Um, kombucha is in play. You want to make sure that it has live active cultures. And then there's other ones like tempeh, um, miso. And then I would even say sourdough. Um, now the sourdough is not going to have live active cultures, but it does have these unique forms of fiber and other benefits that you get because it went through a fermentation process. You quickly reeled off prebiotics before, but perhaps you can remind us from a definition point of view, what does prebiotic mean? And as an umbrella term, like what, what does it actually encompass? Prebiotics are this exciting thing that you and I have been talking about for five years now, but I think that the market is starting to catch up on the, on the concepts that you and I uh, introduced in episode 17. And so prebiotics, basically, if I were to use it in layman's terms, it's food for your microbiome. Um, if you're talking about uh, it from a scientific perspective, it's some sort of substrate, which basically means some sort of um, uh, compound that you are introducing to the gut that the microbes will then consume or metabolize. And in the process of doing that, they will, number one, microbes will grow stronger. So there is a change within the microbiome as a result of prebiotics. And number two, you actually will get health benefits as a result of it. So in order for something to qualify as a prebiotic, it has to impact your gut microbes and it has to impact your health in a beneficial way. You need those two things. Mm -hmm. And so where we're getting those when we're eating a diversity of plants, how do you feel about prebiotic supplements? Because that's a big category now. And if someone's in the kind of grocery store or supplement store, they're faced with a lot of different options. So do you have any advice or do you recommend a prebiotic supplement in this context of taking a course of antibiotics and how could someone kind of navigate that to, to choose one that's going to be most beneficial? I have had great experience with the use of prebiotic fiber supplements within this context and also uh, with people who have other digestive health issues such as irritable bowel syndrome, whether it be constipation or diarrhea predominant. I've had great success using um, prebiotic fiber supplements in that space. Now, Let's drill down on what to look for in a prebiotic, what you want. Um, what you don't want is something that, well, first of all, it has to be prebiotic, right? So not, not all forms of fiber actually are prebiotic. So it needs to be demonstrated in a study to actually impact the microbiome and to have health benefits. So it has to be prebiotic. Um, number two, taking massive doses of a monofiber is not the approach for winning. 
Because again, and we, I mentioned this a moment ago, the evidence suggests that there's a certain amount of benefit that you will get once you cross a threshold. And then it's time to move on to something else because you're not going to get more benefits from hammering and pounding the exact same thing more, more, more. You just, you know, more, more, more does not translate into more in this case. You get what you get. <laughs> it's time to move on. Um, <laughs> so, and um, so I, I don't recommend that people like pound monofibers and take, you know, 10, 15 grams of whatever it may be. When you say pound a monofiber, are we talking like, like a straight up inulin or something? Yeah, exactly. And the issue, and I think inulin is bringing up a good point because inulin is prebiotic, but the issue is inulin also is extremely gas producing. It, that's because inulin is literally the definition of a fructan, which is a FODMAP. So one of the things that you can do if you want to be smart about this is think about the fact that you literally are in a state of dysbiosis. Again, you have medically induced a dysbiosis. We want to restore eubiosis. But when you when you have a damaged gut, you are far more, far more likely to suffer symptoms as a result of adding fiber to your diet. So the way that we can approach this, Simon, is to choose low FODMAP forms of prebiotics. Low FODMAP forms of prebiotics are ultimately going to achieve the effect that we're looking for, support the microbes, give us the health benefits, restore the gut barrier. This is what we want, but the, but the difference being that you don't have to feel miserable and gassy and bloated and all of those things because you just added this, this prebiotic supplement. Right. So how does someone navigate that? Is that a do they need to understand which ingredients are low FODMAP and not, or are they looking for low FODMAP? It would be clearly called out on the, on the label. It's not necessarily likely to be clearly called out. Part of this is um, understanding the individual types of fiber that exist and which ones are uh, high FODMAP versus low FODMAP. I mentioned that inulin is high FODMAP. Uh, acacia powder or partially hydrolyzed guar gum are examples of fibers that are low FODMAP. Those are options, okay? Now, the issue here is, again, those are monofibers. It's just one form of fiber. If we want something better, we want a blend. We want a mix. We want to be hitting multiple thresholds. And we also shouldn't just think about fiber because fiber isn't the only prebiotic. There are different types of prebiotics. Resistant starches are prebiotics. Polyphenols are prebiotics. The way that this works is when you eat a meal, most of what you consume is digested and absorbed and broken down in your small intestine. But there are these parts that will arrive into your colon intact the same way that they were when you entered, entered your stomach. And these are the prebiotics. Fiber, resistant starches, and polyphenols. Each of them in their own unique way has the ability to impact your microbiome, to support the beneficial gut bugs, and to achieve health benefits for you. Hey friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide, Plant-Based Ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. In the last episode that I was on, I mentioned that I'm starting a supplement company. And the intent of that supplement company called 38 Terra is to take gut health supplements to a level that's never been seen before. Which stands for 38 trillion. 38 Terra stands for 38 trillion because we have 38 Love trillion it. microbes. And this, this company, um, we are focused on the gut. We believe that um, health benefits come from supporting and nurturing the gut, whether you are sick or not sick, or you just took antibiotics. I believe that the key in, in, in this case is to support the, support the gut, because when you do that, there are downstream benefits throughout the entire body. So, we're talking about like, what is the preferable uh, prebiotic supplement? And I mentioned like, we want to get as many different microbes as possible. And we want different types of prebiotics, fiber, resistant starch, and polyphenols. And that is exactly what our first product called Daily Microbiome Nutrition is. It wasn't developed specifically for the purpose 
of being used after antibiotics. It was developed to support a person who has a damaged gut and allow them to restore their gut. It was also developed for the person who does not currently have gut issues and wants to continue to have a healthy gut and wants to support and elevate their gut microbes as much as possible. But when you think about like what we're looking for after antibiotics, this checks all the boxes because we have seven different unique plants. We have all three forms of prebiotics being represented, fiber, resistant starches, and polyphenols that give you exactly what you're looking for. And by the way, the fiber that was selected and used in this product, Daily Microbiome Nutrition, again, like this was developed with people with gut issues in mind, but it's for everyone. Huh. And these fibers are low FODMAP. So you don't need to worry about that issue. Mm. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that, swapping out that one that I showed you before. Well, the cool thing about <laughs> it is, the cool thing about it is that like um, we were talking about having a healthy gut before taking the antibiotics, during the antibiotics, after the antibiotics. And that's this this product is designed to help you to have a healthy gut um, used on a daily basis to ensure that your gut bugs are getting the nutrition that they need. Right. So you take that once a day? You take that once a day. You take that once a day. Now for some people may want to, I think I feel like this is a different conversation. There are some people that may want to amp that up to twice a day, but for the vast majority of people, once a day is all you need. The people can go to 38terra.com if they want to read more about that. 38terra.com is where you can read more and check it out. Okay. So polyphenols, resistant starch, prebiotic fiber, all in that one blend. All in that one blend. Se seven plants, three forms of prebiotics, one bioactive supplement that is so easily taken once a day. You literally just take a scoop, stir some water, and you drink it, and it tastes delicious. Every time I hear resistant starch, I think about cooked and cooled potatoes which I think you shared with us once yeah. in a previous episode and green bananas. <laughs> yeah, those are sort of the classic places that you can get resistant starch from. But what's, what's interesting about the resistant starch that you'll find in this product specifically is that it's been um, clinically tested in humans and we're using the dose that was used in the clinical trial, which is, I think, a unique thing when it comes to supplements. Many supplements will make claims without actually using the effective dose that was demonstrated in a randomized controlled trial to actually achieve the effect. And so like, this is just one of the ingredients within daily microbiome nutrition, but with the, with the uh, resistant starch from the potatoes, you're getting resistant starch type two. And what they found in this human clinical trial is that over the course of four weeks, people are increasing two specific types of bacteria that basically every single one of us, we want more of. One was acromancia. Acromancia is um, associated with our metabolism and also our immune system. And they increased acromancia by 317% using this type of resistant starch for four weeks, once a day at the dose that's in daily microbiome nutrition. And they increased the bifidobacteria uh, which, by the way, bifidobacteria are the uh, friendly bacteria that you find in many probiotics. And they are also the friendly bacteria that people grow when they breastfeed. Um, so, but they're like beneficial throughout life. And they increase the bifidobacteria 350%. Again, it's the exact dose that you will find in this product. I think there might be some people listening that are thinking, is, that, is this product something that kids can take and pregnant women take? I'm assuming this is just a food product product based on food ingredients. So is it safe for everyone to take? I see no, I see no uh, reason that a child or a pregnant woman would not be able to take this product. Um, it's, it's dairy free. Um, it's keto friendly. It's paleo. It's vegan. Um, so, you know, in all those set cases, it seems okay. I think that the one thing that I would say is you should always, you know, whether it's this product or something else, you should always talk to your doctor about it. Yeah. Anytime you kind of add something to your regime. Yeah. So that's, that's prebiotics. So if you take a, a few steps down the aisle, you you may get to a fridge and then there is probiotics and also some probiotics on shelf, ambient probiotics. Uh, you mentioned in one of our previous episodes, a, an interesting study out of Israel looking at probiotics during or after an antibiotic uh, course. Perhaps you can remind us of that. 
Yeah, so um, study done, published in 2018, September 2018. I like remember very explicitly those September. And in the journal Cell, which again, this is one of the top medical journals on the planet. And they convincingly showed, because they, they basically broke people into three groups. Um, those who received probiotics after antibiotics, those who received a fecal transplant, of their own microbiome from before the antibiotics. Um, and then those who got neither of those two things and basically were just allowed to recover passively, whatever happens, happens. So now in this study, um, these were healthy, healthy people, so they didn't have an infection. Again, that's the only sort of fair way to do this because then um, you know that they're starting off from a baseline of health. And they all received the same antibiotics. These are antibiotics, Cipro and uh, Fladril, Metronidazole, that are commonly used for gut infections. And the probiotic that they used for people who received the probiotic had 11 different strains. So it was just this one type of probiotic. Now, here, here's what they found. The, the recovery of the microbiome after antibiotics was the fastest among those who received the fecal transplant. Basically, you gave them their own microbiome back and they were good. Now, the issue with this is that I am not aware of any sort of way for us, at least at this point, to store our poop in a fashion that we could give ourselves a fecal transplant if we have to take antibiotics in the future, right? Like this is an unpredictable thing. So it's not super helpful what they found with that right there. Um, but the surprising part, the part that went against everything that conventional wisdom said was that the people who took the probiotics actually had a slower recovery than those who took no probiotic or anything at all. They just passively let their microbiome bounce back. Um, now, this, this was a big surprise. And it changed the way that I approach this issue. And I do want to unpack it if you'll allow me to more in a moment. But before I go there, I think it's very important that I acknowledge some of the limitations of the study that was done. Um, because we need to see more data. <laughs> so does it change some things for me? Yes, because this is the best information that I have at the moment. But this is not written in stone. Right, so and let's perfect. be careful. Yeah. So how many people did uh, they have in the probiotic group? They had eight. So like if you were a parent and I said, well, I'm a pediatrician and I'm going to give your child this thing based upon a study of eight people, would you be excited with me? You might be a little bit upset, right? This is the best data that we have, but it was only eight people. We don't know that this is generalizable. Maybe there was something weird about these eight people. Maybe three of them were outliers. You never know. That's definitely possible. The second thing is that it was only one type of probiotic. It happened to have 11 strains. Um, that doesn't mean that more strains is necessarily a bad thing, but maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe too many strains is a bad thing. It also was bacteria. It was not a yeast. There are forms of yeast probiotics that are beneficial and like very well studied and good for us. So maybe it would be different with a different probiotic. Maybe it would be different with a yeast probiotic. Um, and then the third thing is this hasn't been reproduced anywhere else. Anytime we have research that they've only found it in one place, we got to be a little bit careful bef before we start running wild with it because sometimes we find things at one medical center and who knows, I'm not trying to make accusations that they're making stuff up, but who knows what was going on in that lab that led to this result. We need to see the same thing reproduced in other places. So um, there are some limitations to this study. Now, how do we, how do we pull this together? Uh, like, what do we do with this information? Well, I think that it's important to understand that the outcome that they were using in this study, like what they were looking at, was the recovery of the microbiome. How long does it take for the microbiome to recover? That is a different thing than the reason why many people actually take a probiotic. The reason why many people take a probiotic, Simon, is actually to protect themselves from diarrhea and to protect themselves from the infection that we were talking about earlier, the C. diff infection. When you say protect themselves from diarrhea, some antibiotics can cause diarrhea. Many antibiotics can cause diarrhea. And the evidence with probiotics is very clear. Now, some are better than others, but generally speaking, in a systematic review and meta-analysis, probiotics 
taking with and after antibiotics clearly reduce the risk of antibiotic associated diarrhea. And there's also specific ones. Um, one of them that I'm a fan of is called Saccharomyces boulardii. And Saccharomyces boulardii uh, has been demonstrated to reduce the risk of antibiotic associated diarrhea, but it's also been demonstrated to reduce the risk of developing the C. diff infection. That's a yeast based probiotic. It's a yeast based probiotic. It's a good yeast. Mm -hmm. So in people who you select a probiotic, the goal is different. The goal is to protect them from these specific things. That's not the same as gut recovery. So how do we how do we deal with this? Okay, here's what we do. Let me just break this down and try to make it simple for people. If uh, you are super young, like you're talking about your kid who's under three, um, or you're super old, or you are high risk for complications because you have other heart other issues that could be heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, etc. Right, a vulnerable a vulnerable patient or you have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, these are all people that probably should be taking probiotics. And the other that I would say is if you've ever had a C. diff infection before, then you definitely should be considering probiotics. And how, do, how would those people, before you, you move on, how would they choose a probiotic? Well, you someone? want something that's evidence-based. So I, I, there, there are a number of different choices that exist. The Saccharomyces boulardii that I mentioned is widely available. It's not under any patent. And um, so it's not very expensive. And, uh, and it has actually highly compelling evidence to indicate that it works. So guidelines, there are guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology that actually recommend it. And so on the front of a lot of these is like a CFU colony forming units, I think yep. that stands for. Is that important to look at? It is important. And so the dose, the dose needs to be like, basically, as I was mentioning earlier with the DMN, the daily microbiome nutrition supplement, you know, if we want something to work, you should be taking it at the dose that was demonstrated in the clinical studies. Um, that's true of medications and that's also true of supplements. And so in this case, with the Saccharomyces boulardii, the dose is 500 milligrams. So it's not necessarily represented with the CFUs in the case of Saccharomyces boulardii, but the dose is 500 milligrams is the dose that you want. So now, if you're not one of these people, young, old, tons of comorbidities, inflammatory bowel disease, or a history of C. diff infection, the chances are you probably don't need to take probiotics after antibiotics. Okay, and in the instance that someone does feel compelled to take a probiotic, how long do they take it for? Okay, so if you, if you do end up taking a probiotic, um, we're no longer of the frame of mind, based upon what we know, that the probiotic is going to help you recover your microbiome. So we only want to take it for the purpose of protecting ourselves from antibiotic-associated diarrhea or this C. diff infection. So the way that we do this is we take it for the duration that you're on, like you literally start it while you're on the antibiotics. And you take it for the duration that you're on the antibiotics, and then I would continue it for about a week. And then after that, you just stop. So would it be fair to say, it sounds like the conversation around gut health and diversity has changed a bit over the years. There was a lot of focus on probiotics, which clearly have their place for very specific things. But would it be fair to say now the emphasis really is on prebiotics and the importance of prebiotics for building diversity? Well, here's what we know. I have not seen a study where taking a probiotic has the impact on gut diversity that you can accomplish through dietary strategies. So, and dietary strategies, really what you're talking about are the prebiotics. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's to me where the focus yeah. needs to be. Okay. So to kind of recap this, this protocol for during antibiotic use, hopefully prior to and, and after we've spoken about the importance of a diversity of plants, high fiber diet, we're talking fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, seeds, uh, legumes, whole grains, that sort of stuff. We mentioned sprouts. Um, you spoke about fermented foods and working some of those into your diet, prebiotic supplements playing their role. We just spoke about probiotics. Is there anything that we should limit or any foods that we should maybe avoid? Yes. Your gut is uh, in a state of dysbiosis. It's trying to heal. Now is not the time 
for the things in our diet that actually are dysbiosis inducing. So we want to, to the best of our ability, limit things like alcohol, simple carbohydrates like sugars, saturated fats, fried foods, um, ultra processed foods. But th- those to me are the foods that, like again, it's, you're not, you don't have to be perfect. But we're not down at McDonald's having Big Macs. <laughs> Definitely not at McDonald's <laughs> having Big Macs. And I think, I think they like, you know, g- generally speaking, I mean, this is a time to give yourself, you know, we talked about it. it takes about two months for your gut to recover. Do you have to stay this way for two months? Not necessarily, but the longer that you stay this way, the more it's going to help your gut to recover. And to me, it would be like, you know, at least two weeks, but ideally four or more. And who knows, you may build some, some really healthy habits that end up sticking. Well, that's, that's actually a good point. I mean, if this, uh, that's making uh, lemonade out of lemons, right? If it's like, if you have to take antibiotics, but then it sort of translates into healthy habits, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, let's finish here with a couple of questions that came in from the community. The first one is, why do antibiotics cause yeast infections and do probiotics really help counteract this? Okay, within any ecosystem, whether it be your gut, your throat, a woman's vagina, there is a balance of microbes. And if you disrupt that balance, then you can develop potentially overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, but you could also develop overgrowth of yeasts. These are one of the ways in which you can manifest dysbiosis. A yeast infection, vaginal yeast infection, or thrush, which is a yeast infection of the throat or the esophagus, these are manifestations of dysbiosis within those specific microbial ecosystems. And it's the result of antibiotics. It's not a coincidence that antibiotics are what ultimately promote the development of these issues. And do probiotics help counteract that? Um, I believe that there, is, there are some data that probiotics, whether it be vaginal probiotics or actually, um, I believe there's even some data with oral probiotics that they may actually provide benefit in terms of preventing yeast infection. So vaginal yeast infection. So if you're the type of person who's had issues with yeast infections with antibiotics in the past, then you may want to consider probiotics within that context. Okay, second question. Do antibiotics help or harm an individual that is diagnosed with SIBO? That's complicated. (laughs) Maybe Um, start with what is SIBO? SIBO is an acronym that stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And, you know, essentially what uh, is going on here is that you have an overgrowth or an excessive amount of bacteria that are getting up into places that they're not supposed to be, such as the small intestine. You know, they're supposed to be in the colon, yet they have snuck up into the intestine or hanging out there. To me, this is indicative of damaged gut. This is indicative of dysbiosis. This is indicative of um, abnormal bowel motility. And this is how you ultimately lead to this happening. And my, um, if you look at the data with regard to, and there's a number of different antibiotic choices that are available on the market, um, in varying ways, they affect the microbiome. The issue that I see is that these studies that are done with the antibiotics are short-term studies. What happens within the next couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but not beyond just a couple of months? I want to know, what is the price that we're paying in terms of our microbiome? We know that you have dysbiosis. You have SIBO. We know that you have dysbiosis. What is the price that we pay by digging you deeper into dysbiosis? Do we emerge with healing? Do we emerge with eubiosis, a a better microbiome than when we started? Simon, my experience is this. Again, we don't have data. This I'm just sharing my anecdotal experience as a gastroenterologist. I've had a ca- occasional, like there's going to be people who are listening to this that, that say, that was me. I was better. I was better because I took antibiotics. I have no doubt that there are some people who benefit from taking antibiotics and when they have SIBO. The problem is that the vast majority of people, they may be temporarily better and then they get worse. Right. So we need some longer term studies. And in in many cases, what I observe is that by taking antibiotics, they end up taking them repeatedly. I feel like they're digging themselves deeper and deeper into a hole. They're temporarily better, but then when it flares back up, it flares back up worse than it was in the first place. 
And that's that's what I've observed. So my concern is that we're not actually addressing this issue the way that, it, you know, it makes sense. Oh, you got too much bacteria. Let's just kill them. Yeah, but you're killing all the bacteria. You're taking dysbiosis and you're making it more dysbiotic. So where is the evidence that when we emerge on the other side, we have something that's healthier? That's what I want to see. I haven't seen that. Third question and final one. Thank you to everyone that sent these in on Instagram. Outside of diet, what else can I do with my lifestyle to help my microbiome recover after a course of antibiotics? Okay, so we, we talked about the benefits of fiber, a diversity of plants, fermented foods, and um, prebiotic fiber supplements. But it's not just, and, and we talked about avoidance of some of those, you know, sort of um, dysbiosis inducing things like sugar and um, saturated fat and alcohol. It's not just about what you eat. Um, your gut microbiome is more complicated than that. And it's a reflection of the lifestyle that you lead. Uh, actually, it's kind of interesting in the fiber study that I mentioned earlier, where fiber um, helped uh, recovery of the microbiome. There was another finding in that study. They found that the mice that were living by themselves were very slow to recover their microbiome. Whereas the, micro the mice that were cohabitating with other mice, they bounced back much more quickly. Hmm. That's because we share microbes. Cohabitation, hmm. being social, huh. being around other people. Lots of hugs and lots of kisses. <laughs> Without getting Come yourself into here. trouble. Come over here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, but I think um, recognizing that we are social creatures, also recognizing that our gut microbes, they are alive, much like you and I are. And I can just tell you firsthand, because I've done this, I've worked 36 hours straight, that when you work too many hours straight without a break, you become really bad at your job. Our microbes are better at their job when they're given an opportunity to rest. This is the concept behind fasting. And fasting doesn't need to be this rigorous, crazy, you know, multi-day thing. It can be so simple as, I. this is what I would recommend. Choose a 10-hour window during the day that works for you. We don't have to do a 30-day. No, you fast. don't have to do a 30-day water fast. No. <laughs> so, but during your day, like apply, apply this simple concept, particularly when you are recovering from antibiotic use. Choose a 10-hour window that you're going to eat. Don't eat outside that 10-hour window. Now, there's a couple of uh, quick caveats to this. The 10-hour the window, you should have at least an hour before you start, after you wake up. Give your body an hour to wake up. And the second caveat is it shouldn't touch, it shouldn't be within three hours of when you sleep. So anywhere within this period of time that you're awake, there's your 10-hour window. Choose it, set it. And then outside that window, no solid food. So you're syncing up your meal timing with your circadian rhythm. You're syn syncing up your meal timing with your circadian rhythm, and you're simultaneously providing a 14-hour time period that your gut microbes are not going to be asked to do work to help you to process and digest food. And so, and during that time, they're actually in a way kind of resetting. It's kind of like if you work in an office, everyone leaves at five o'clock, but here come here comes the cleaning squad. And the cleaning squad's going to spend the time while everyone else is gone to get everything cleaned up, get everything vacuumed and whatnot. And your gut deserves that opportunity to rest and to go through that cleaning cycle. The 10 hour window is nice as well in that it still allows you from a social perspective to have a breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yeah, if you want, you could absolutely do that. And it doesn't have to be like if you want to restrict it to less than 10 hours, that's perfectly fine, too. But what I have found is that a 10 hour window is a very accessible manageable thing for people to do and this is so this is an easy thing that everyone can add this has been incredibly informative i think it's a, a very clear protocol for people to follow should they need to take a, a course of antibiotics to to kind of help their gut recover as quickly and best as possible is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to add before we land the plane don't forget sleep don't forget exercise don't forget time outdoors. These are other lifestyle measures that you can add. And when it comes down to decisions, when it comes, when, when you're thinking about antibiotics, um, I'm not here to vilify antibiotics. I, I mentioned earlier, they literally are what I would rank as the number one breakthrough in medicine of the last 100 years. Um, but the choice is about risk and benefit. And we need to understand both sides of that equation in order to make a good choice. 
And what's been missing is a good, proper understanding of risk. That's a lot of what we've talked about today. But the other thing that's been missing is you asking the right questions of your provider so that you can understand the benefit. What is the benefit of taking these antibiotics? Why do I need them? And if we can cut down on the unnecessary antibiotic use, that is the most powerful way for us to protect ourselves. Yeah, I think there'll be many people writing those three questions down. That was super helpful. Remind folks how they can connect with the great Dr. B online and where, where they can get a copy of your books. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook as the Gut Health MD. I am also on TikTok. Um, I am the gut health MD underscore because there's like some probably 14 Someone year old squatted. kid. Yeah. Some 14 year old kid who took my handle. Uh, he what's might up? try and sell it to you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, if you got it, call me up. Let me know. Uh, we could talk about that. Yeah. Um, hey kid, if you're listening, contact me first. I'll let you know how much to charge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think uh, we can squeeze a bit out of the big fella. And you can, and of course you can also find more about um, my work, my courses, my books, and also this brand new supplement company, 38 Terra. Our first product is daily microbiome nutrition. You can find more about all these things at the plantfedgut.com. Or if you really want to just focus on the daily microbiome nutrition, go to 38terra.com and you'll find that 38tera.com. Beautiful. We'll put uh, links to all of that into the show notes. Thanks so much for doing this, mate. I know the listeners and, and myself are very appreciative and grateful for all the work you do and, and taking the time to do this today. My pleasure. And, you know, this is, uh, I mentioned earlier, this is like one of the most common questions that I get. So um, whether you need it or whether you find that a friend who needs it, when you have a friend who needs it, recommend they check out this podcast. I think it breaks it down for them. Thanks, mate. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.